Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, the Bible reads, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The title for the sermon is Pure in Heart. Okay? I want to talk a little bit about purity. Okay? God calls us to be people that are pure in heart. And if we're pure in heart, the Bible tells us that we shall see God. Okay? What an amazing truth that we can see God as long as we remain pure in heart. Okay? So just three things. First of all, why should we be pure? You know, why should we be people that are pure? Well, first of all, being pure is a requirement for salvation. Okay? Being pure is a requirement for salvation. And I'm going to read to you from Hebrews 10.22. It says, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. You see, in order for you to be saved, in order for you to have that profession of faith, you must be pure. And how are we made pure? We're made pure by the pure water. We're made pure by the sprinkling of the blood of Christ. Okay? That's first and foremost. In order for us to even have the ability to see God, you know, in our resurrected bodies, we must first be pure in our heart, you know. And a reality is the more you remain pure, the more you'll know God. You know, the more you keep yourself clean from sin and the corruption of this world, the more you're going to understand God, the more you're going to be able to see God in faith. So obviously, I don't want to talk about salvation. Our position before the Lord is pure, okay? When he looks at our position, just like Brother Callum mentioned, right? He sees the goodness in us. He sees the righteousness in us, okay? But we're not always pure in our walk. You know, in our, in our daily walk with the Lord, in our daily fellowship, in our daily living, we're not always pure. So that's what I want to focus on uh, today. If you guys can, um, I'll get you guys to turn to, let's have a look. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, please. Ecclesiastes chapter 11. And while you're turning there, I'm going to read to you from Proverbs chapter 20, verse 9. The question is, who can say, I have made my heart clean, I am pure from my sin? Can anyone say that? Can any of you say that I've made my heart clean? Okay, that I am pure from my sin? Now, there are those out there, all right, that will say, yeah, I've never sinned. I'm sinless. You know, since I got saved, they'll say, I've never committed sin, right? And they look at their sinless perfection, so-called, as their evidence for salvation, which is just another valued works-based gospel. You know, I'm keeping the commandments. I'm doing well. But the Bible's quite clear, a rhetorical question there in the book of Proverbs, who can make the heart clean? You know, who, who can say that they are pure from their sin? And so, you know, I, I often talk about this, you know, in order for us to, to uh, you know, move forward in our faith, in order for us to do great works of God, the first thing we need to realize is we can never, you know, in our daily walk, in our daily walk with the Lord, we can never make ourselves completely pure, completely sinless, okay? You're going to struggle with the flesh. You're going to struggle with that sinful nature till the day you die, okay? And in order for you to progress in your walk with the Lord, in order for you to be a faithful person, you must just recognize that fact, okay? Otherwise, when you fail, you're going to beat yourself up every time. You know, just continue beating yourself up, being continually down, and, and, and always just, man, why can't I progress from this sinful state? Look, just, you've got to understand that's just going to be part of your life. But the danger of saying that's just something you've got to accept, the danger is, well, I guess if I just have to accept that, then I just have to, well, I'm not going to try to live righteously. You know, I'm just going to, well, I'm going to sin, so I just might as well give in to my sins. Well, that's, that's a wrong view also, okay? Because we are called to walk in pureness. We are called to have that pure heart in our daily walk, okay? Now, you guys are in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 9. Because one thought that comes in our minds, and, you know, this is where the, the non-believing world, when they look at Christians, they think, man, that religion's full of commandments, full of restrictions, you know, it's prison. Why would we want to, you know, be Christians? You know, we can't live our lives freely. We can't enjoy life because all the commandments and the restrictions that are in the Word of God. But look at Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 9. The Bible says, Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart, and in the sight of thine eyes. So here we have this statement here. Hey, you know, when you're, you're in your youth and, you know, you know, in, in your life, 
you know, enjoy your life. You know, rejoice in your life. Rejoice in the life that you have. You know, make the most of what you have, right? You know, living a Christian life isn't about just being this, you know, recluse, secluded person that's stuck in your house. You never want to step foot out of the house just in case there's some unclean thing to see. And, and you become, you know, uh, withdrawn from everything. You know, you become depressed. That's not the call for the Christian life. The Christian life is that we will rejoice in the liberty and the freedom that we have in the Lord. I mean, we're the only, you know, believers are the only people that can truly live a life of joy, you know, of true joy, knowing that our sins have been paid for. But we need to be careful with that freedom. We've got to be careful with that liberty. Because look, at the, the rest of it says, but know thou that for all things God will bring thee into judgment. Okay? So why be pure? Because when we're not walking rightly, when we're sinning, when we're committing uh, sins, the Bible says that we're going to be brought into judgment. The Lord's going to judge us for the sins that we commit. Okay? Now you say, well, that judgment's been paid for by Christ. Yes, it has been in that positional sense. But you know, if you commit sin today, as a child of God, the Lord will judge you. The Lord will bring chastisement upon your life. You know? And sometimes when I sin, I'm like, Lord, just please be merciful with your chastisement. You know, I'm not asking the Lord to not chastise me because, you know, listen, parents, if you don't chastise your kids, they'll never learn. Okay, so we want to learn. We want to grow. We want to mature. But just like my kids sometimes tell me, just a little smack, Dad. <laughs> just a little one now. <laughs> you know, sometimes, you know, that's what I'm saying to the Lord. Just a little one, Lord. You know, let me learn the lesson. But, you know, hopefully it's not too severe. So, look, we want to avoid that kind of judgment. We don't want to destroy our lives in sin. But at the same time, the Lord does want us to rejoice in the life that we have. He wants us to enjoy life. And that's where a lot of Christians, you know, get things wrong. I mean, I mean, obviously Catholics are not Christians, but you see these people, these nuns and these, you know, priests or whatever, where they beat themselves, they lock themselves in, in what do they call them? These nun things. They, they, they're just, what is it? Oh, I don't know. But they, you know, they, they destroy themselves. They, they just, you know, bury themselves because they don't want to sin. You know, they just want to be, keep themselves for God. Hey, but they're not enjoying the life. They're not, they're not enjoying the life. I mean, they're not even saved to begin with. But, you know, that would be the wrong way to, to live a life where you're just too afraid to do anything. No, enjoy your life, but just be mindful about, you know, not breaking the laws of God and avoiding the judgment for God. And the other important thing about keeping pure, it's not just, um, you know, a, a, a sin that damages yourself. But you need to also keep yourself pure. So I'm talking to the young people here, to the children. You want to keep your, your body pure. You want to keep yourself pure uh, so you can make the most of your marriage. Okay? You don't want to be a fornicator. You, know, you don't want to be someone that defiles your eyes, that defiles your mind, that defiles your body. Because you want to keep yourself pure for that husband or that wife that God has prepared for you. Now, I'm going to read to you from Hebrews 13. You guys go to 1 Corinthians 6. I'm going to read to you from Hebrews chapter 13. You guys go to 1 Corinthians 6. So Hebrews 13 verse 4 says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Okay? Whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Now why would God judge that? Because the, the, you know, marriage is, is very sacred. It's a very holy institution that God has you know, given to us for the enjoyment, you know, between, um, you know, the different sexes, but also the, you know, the, of having children, of having a family, to raise that godly seed. God wants us to keep that bed, that marriage bed, undefiled. And, you know, children, I really encourage you because you live in a world that's just wanting you to defile your body, wanting you to defile the flesh, wanting you to go into fornication. I mean, you just turn on the music of this world, and it's about fornication. It's about going from, you know, girlfriend to girlfriend or boyfriend to boyfriend. And even the song today is about sodomy, okay? And, and, and you know, I mean, just the musicians, these are just pushing homosexuality, just pushing any kind of defilement. And you go, well, you know, I haven't defiled my body. But if you listen to those words, it's defiling your mind. You know, you, the Lord calls you to keep yourself pure. You guys are in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. The Bible says, flee fornication. And children, let me say to you, young people, flee fornication. Please. You know, if you're ever tempted to fornicate, you know, don't be someone that says, well, I'm strong enough here. You know, I, I'm mature enough to, to uh, you know, to put up with this, you know, put up with this temptation. No, the Bible says, flee. Get out of there. 
Keep yourself pure. You know, it doesn't matter if you embarrass yourself to physically get at that situation. You know, even Joseph had to flee Potiphar's wife, you know, to keep himself pure. When, when it comes to fornication, you know, that is a temptation that is strong to man. And, and the answer to that, guys, is just to get yourself physically out of that situation. If you ever find yourself tempted to fornicate, the Bible says, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. 19, verse 19. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own? Hey, your body is not your own body. Okay, it's the temple of the Holy Ghost if you're saved. The Lord God, you know, resides in you. His Spirit is there in you. Verse number 20. For ye are bought with a price. What was that price? How did God purchase your body? Well, the price of Christ, right? Christ's suffering. I mean, keep that in your mind when you're tempted to fornicate. Hey, that my body's not mine. It belongs to the Lord, and it's been purchased by His sacrifice. That's going to help you overcome temptation. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You see, if you keep your body pure, you are glorifying the Lord, even though this flesh is fallen, even though this flesh is weak. But if you keep this body pure from fornication, the Bible says that you glorify God in your body. What, a, what an amazing thing. You keep yourself pure to, for, your, for the marriage bed. The Bible says you're glorifying God. You're keeping yourself pure and it, it brings God all the glory. All right. So we see the necessity. Why be pure? Why be pure? Because it's the calling of God in our lives. Okay. And it, it will keep you from being judged. It will keep you from being chastised by the Lord. And of course, like I said, the first point was salvation is being made pure in that positional sense. Okay. Now, how to be pure. Let's get to some practical points here. Um, I'll get you guys to go to um, Psalm 101, please. Psalm 101. And uh, how to be pure. I'm going to read to you from Matthew 5, 8, which is what I started with. Just as a reminder, the Bible said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. See God. How do we see things? With our eyes. The first thing I want you to think about to keep pure are your eyes. Okay. Now, Psalm 101 verse 3 says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Hey, the Bible tells us here that we are to not set wicked things before our eyes. And we've been looking at the book of Genesis. We've been looking at Lot, haven't we? And how when he, when he found those well-watered plains, he set his tent, you know, to... Uh, he set his tent to, towards Sodom, okay? Every time he woke up, his eyes were set on Sodom. He would see Sodom. Then we see in the next chapter, there he is living in Sodom, you know, getting involved in a war that was not his business, okay? And him being taken into captivity. That's what sin's going to do for you. If you just start setting your eyes on something, you know, it's going to lead you down a bad path. You know, pornography. You know, you put pornography before your eyes, before you know it, you're going to be committing acts. You're going to be committing fornication. You're going to be committing adultery in your heart when you set those things before your eyes. Okay? And it's, it's a tough one because we walk with our eyes open. You know? I mean, you spend most of your life with your eyes open and it can affect your thought life. You know, again, you know, I've mentioned this so many times, but that's why I don't go to the beaches where there's all these... All, all the nudity. I don't go there, okay? Now, I love my wife, okay? My eyes are for my wife, and yes, I'm sp strong spiritually, you know, that there's a lesser temptation to me to look on another woman than, than my wife. Nevertheless, you know, the Bible tells me here, if I set that wicked, before my, uh, wicked thing before my eyes, it will have an effect on me. I'm still made of flesh. I'm still made of the same uh, fallen nature, and if I set things before my eyes, it's definitely going to affect my life there. Now, um, you know, I mean, you can, you can apply this to many things. A lot of people apply this verse to television. You know, and I don't think a screen or television in of itself is a sinful thing. You know, it's just a tool that you can be, it can be used for good. It can use for, be used for evil. Most often it's used for evil, all right? But be careful of what you watch. Be careful of what programs you put on. I mean, even, even uh, YouTube these days, you know, even though my subscriptions are all kind of righteous, godly things, right, it still brings up the random recommendation at the end of the video. I'm like, why is it showing me that? Why has that come up? You know, I'm not talking about the cartoons that the kids sometimes watch, but just evil things. 
just, just women, you know, dressed immodestly, just, you know, nudity, things like that. It's like, why is that coming up as my recommendation there on YouTube? So be careful of what you watch. Be careful because, you know, uh, the ad, even though you're watching something, you know, that's righteous, you know, the advertising, the things that are there that, that these other, um, these platforms use may uh, tempt you to, to think of other things, things that are sinful, things that are wicked. Uh, go to Matthew chapter 6, please. Matthew chapter 6, verse 22. Matthew chapter 6, verse 22. Jesus says these words, and uh, let's take this to heart because you may not realize just how, you know, we think of sin about the things that we do. We think of sins about the things that we think. But it all starts with what we look at, okay? And Matthew chapter 6, verse 22, Jesus says, The light of the body is the eye, okay? Now, what, that's just... That's just science, right? So, uh, light, the, the way the light, light enters your body is through the eye, okay? The reason you can see is because light hits the back of your retina, or whatever it is, and, and you can see, okay? The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, now what's single? Something that's single is one. What he's saying is it's something that's whole, okay? Something, if your eye is whole or healthy in that sense, okay? Thy whole body shall be full of light, you see, what you look at affects your whole body, okay? If you set godly things before your eyes, you know, if you go out there and knock the doors, you know, you, you preach the gospel, you do godly things, you look at, you focus on things that are God, it'll affect your whole body, okay? Your whole body will be full of light, okay? And of course, that's, that's taking that, 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 you know, the, 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 the scientific understanding of the eye and applying that to righteousness in our lives. But look at verse 23, but if thine eye be evil, again, that's not saying your eye's wicked. Evil means harm, something that's harmful. So if your eye is not healthy, if your eye, you know, if, if you have cataracts in your eyes, maybe you're going blind, you can't see that well, okay? If thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness, okay? It's kind of taking the idea of someone that's blind. If you're blind, you can't see where you're going, right? And then it says here, uh, if therefore the light that is in thee be darkness... How great is that darkness? And so we take the spiritual teaching there. Okay, so if you can't see, you, you're blind, you, it's, your whole body's dark. You can't see anything. You can't see where you're going. The spiritual lesson is there. If you set your eyes on wicked things, the things of this world, the things that are corrupted, the things that are sinful, your whole body will be in darkness. Okay, just like the blind person can't see, can't see where they're walking, they're tripping over themselves, they're hurting themselves, you're going to damage your life, you're not going to be pure in your heart if you set the wrong things before your eyes. So pay attention, guys, please don't underestimate your eyes, your physical eyes, what you look at has an effect on your whole body, okay? And our ears, you guys go to uh, Matthew chapter 7, please, Matthew chapter 7, and I'll read a few other passages to you. Our ears. We need to keep our ears pure. The things that we listen to. Luke eleven twenty eight. But he said, Yea, rather blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. We need to be people that hear the word of God. That's why coming to church is so important. There's many reasons why coming to church is important. But you come to church and you have the opportunity to hear the word of God and you keep it. That's how we're blessed by God. We see that in the importance there. I'm going to read to you from Romans 10, 17. Many of you guys know it. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you want to be someone of faith, yes, salvation, but also if you want to be someone that walks in faith, that grows in faith, that has a greater trust in the Lord, you need to hear the word of God. Now look at Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, says Jesus, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Now, all of these references talk about doing the words that we hear, okay? But in order for us to do them, we need to have first have heard of them, have heard of them. So making sure that our ears are listening, are attuned to the things of God is going to also drive you to be able to do the things of God. Right? To set your house uh, as a wise man upon the rock, stability in life. Okay? But if you're hearing the, 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 uh, you know, the, the uh, consultation of the world, if you're hearing what, what, you know, what, what our public school system teaches our children, if that's what's flooding your ears, 
then you're not going to be pure in your body. You're not going to be pure in your mind because you're not going to know the ways of God. You're not going to be able to walk after the ways of God. Again, this is the problem with Lot. Not only did he look upon Sodom, then he lived amongst Sodom and he was hearing the Sodomites talk, okay? And the guy just ruins his life. The third thing, we have the eyes, we have the ears. The third thing is our thoughts. Our thoughts have to be pure. Our thoughts have to be pure, all right? Jesus, uh, God, before he destroyed the earth with a flood in Genesis 6, 5, said, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Okay? I mean, our thought life is dangerous. Okay? This is why I don't like to be idle. I don't like to be, not be doing things. Because when you're not doing things, you start to drift and start imagining things, start thinking about things. And man, I'm telling you, that mind is, can be evil. That mind can be wicked. And when God saw, you know, the state of the earth, He just saw, man, everybody here is just constantly thinking evil things, constantly thinking wicked things. And it angered the Lord so much that He destroys the earth. Okay? And, and you know, I don't, I don't, I mean, obviously there would have been things playing out physically, but the Lord sees the thoughts of man there. All right? And that, that's what causes Him to destroy uh, the earth. Can you guys go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10? 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Brethren, what are the things that you think about? You know, what are the things that you think about when you, when you, really, when you're idle? Because usually when you're working, you haven't got time to think about anything besides the work that you're doing, right? But uh, you guys are going to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to read to you to, uh, uh, from Job 31 verse 1. Job says this, he says, I made a covenant, well, that's an agreement, okay, a promise or an agreement, I made a covenant with mine eyes, why then should I think upon a maid? Why then should I think upon a maid? Job had a wife, okay, Job had a wife and he said, you know what, eyes, I'm making an agreement, he talks to his eyes, his eyes, listen to me, we're making a promise, we're making an agreement, okay, that we're not going to look on any other woman besides my own wife. Okay? And he likens there again, he, with his eyes, why then should I think upon a maid? Okay? And husbands, you know, we need to make sure that we only look at our wives. Okay? We need to make sure that we only think of our wives. We need to keep our thought life pure. You might be keeping your physical life pure. That's a great thing. But the key thing here, and we see this in Job, a godly man, he makes sure that his thought life is pure. He's not thinking about any other woman you know, in that, in that sense, you know, um, you know, loving any other woman, not being emotionally attached to any other woman in his mind, and he made that covenant, that promise with his eyes. And let me encourage you, you know, husbands, if you've not done that, you better do it, okay? You better do, just like Job said, build that covenant, make an agreement with your eyes that you'll only set your eyes upon your wife and upon no other uh, maid, okay? But you guys are in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts of itself against the knowledge of God. Listen, the Antichrist, the beast of Revelation, exalts himself above God. You know, your thought life does the same thing. Your thought life, your brain exalts itself, you know, itself against the knowledge of God, all right? And so that's why we've been instructed to cast down those imaginations, those stupid thoughts the stream of thoughts that enter your mind, when they do enter, just say, look, I'm not going to think about that. You know, find some other things to think about. You know, find a work to do. You know, you start thinking stupid things, just go find something to do with your hands. Or pick up the Bible and start reading the Bible. Start learning the Bible. Start filling your, your mind with godly things. And it says, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Every thought. Every thought to the obedience Hey, every thought that you, that you have, is that thought in obedience to Christ or is it in disobedience to Christ? Man, that's a hard, that's hard. That's a hard, that's a high level of purity, right? But this is what we're called to do, that every thought in our mind ought to be in obedience to the Lord. And verse number six, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. And I've already covered this. How do you revenge? How do you take revenge? Normally, normally we're not allowed to take revenge on other people but you can take revenge on yourself. 
Okay? How do you take revenge on yourself? By, um, you know, take revenge on your disobedience by being obedient. When you become obedient, when your thought life becomes obedient to the Lord, you're taking revenge on your disobedience that you've done in the past. Okay? And just lastly, and this is, this is very important for the world that we live in, we're, we're so bombarded with entertainment, right? It used to just be the TV or the radio. Now we have the internet. You know, the internet was once just in our homes. Now we have it on our phones, right? And like, oh, I almost can't live without. Like, you almost need it. Like, you almost, you know, and that's a bad place. I think it's a bad place to be if you're at a point where you can't. You know, thank God I left my phone at, at home today. You know, it's good, right? But look, uh, Philippians 4.8. Philippians, oh, I don't know if I turn you, sorry, turn there if you want. Philippians 4.8, Philippians 4.8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true. Okay, these are the things that we need to be thinking about. These are the things we need to spend time on, okay? Oh, but that horror movie, oh man, that, that, that blockbuster movie is coming out, you know? Hey, that, that, that famous, you know, uh, musician, that famous artist is coming out. You know, I want to go and see. Look, finally, brethren, what sort of things are true? What sort of things are honest? What sort of things are just? What sort of things are pure? What sort of things are lovely? What sort of things are of good report? If there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things, he says. Man, what are you, what are you thinking of? What, what do you think about? What do you fill your mind with in your life? We're meant to fill our mind with things that are good and honest and true and virtuous, okay, and pure, things that are lovely. God wants us to think about good things. And, you know, I've, I mentioned that when I preached this before, I've, I mentioned that, you know, th there's, there's a, uh, online you can find the truth movement. And, and I, I believe that a lot of, there's a lot of conspiracies in this world. There's a lot of dark forces in this world that's driving the narrative of this world. And I recognize that the devil is behind all that and pulling the strings, okay? And I, I think, you know, that's something that's true. You know, might, the Bible tells us that the kings of the earth are conspiring against the Lord. I mean, that's, that, shouldn't, that shouldn't surprise us as Bible-believing Christians, okay? So while that's true, and while I'm aware of those things, I strongly recommend you don't go deep and dark into those paths, okay? Because those things aren't pure. Those things aren't lovely. You know, and it's just going to bring you down. It's going to uh, make you uh, uh, just, uh, you know, uh, a depressing person. Because these are depressing things, okay? The Lord just says, look, we know, we know the kings of the earth are working against the Lord. We know they're being pulled by the, by the puppet master, the Satan. We know that the, the depths of the heart of man are exceedingly wicked. We see some examples of this in the Bible. But we don't need to fill our minds and hours and hours of, of going down those rabbit holes and finding out these things. We don't need to, we already know. Okay, just pray about those things, leave it in God's hands, and please put your thoughts, your, your mind in the things that are lovely, things that are honest, things that are true, the things of God. And the last thing, guys, the last thing that I have as to what, how, what we need to keep pure is our tongue. So you don't need to turn there, I'll just read these passages to you. Um, and I might get you guys to go to, um, go to Hebrews 13 for me, Hebrews 13, so we'll get to that later on. But... Um, uh, the tongue. So the Bible tells us in Psalm 34, verse 13, keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. What else do we need to keep pure? Not only our eyes, not only our ears, not only our thought, but our tongue, the things that we say, the things that come out of our mouth. We need to keep it from evil, okay? Keep it from harm in other people. You know, our tongues are able to destroy people, okay? Or we can use our tongues to edify people. I mean, which of those two things do you want to do with your mouth, okay? Especially amongst the brethren. You know, do you want to destroy your brothers in the Lord or do you want to lift them up? We're called to lift them up, right? We need to keep our lips from, lips from speaking guile. The fact that God even tells us this, this is what you have to do, tells me that our natural inclination is to gossip. Our natural inclination is to speak evil of other people, okay? Colossians 4, 6 says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man, all right? Let your speech be always, okay, always with grace, seasoned with salt. And salt, of course, purifies. Salt is a purifying agent. Salt also heals wounds, okay? Again, your mouth is able to cause wounds or your mouth is able to heal wounds, okay? Make sure that your speech is seasoned with grace. Make sure that the things that you speak are pure and lift up your brothers and sisters in the Lord, all right? Now, Final thing that I wanted to cover here, we talked about why be pure, 
how to be pure, and now the benefits of being pure, the benefits of purity, all right? Now, just for the, for the ladies, for the, for the wives, I'm going to read to you from Proverbs 31, verse 10. Again, a very familiar passage about the virtuous woman. But I want you to see it. It says, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. Okay? So one, what, the first reason, uh, the first benefit of being pure uh, is that you're trustworthy and valuable in the eyes of others. So others can look at you and say, well, that's a trustworthy person. You know, that, that person, now we're talking about a woman here, a wife, but, you know, we can apply this, this principle to all of us, you know, that if, if we keep ourselves virtuous, we keep ourselves pure, we are valuable. We are valuable in the eyes of others, okay? You're not just this dirty dog. You're not just this, uh, you know, um, untrustworthy person. In other words, keeping pure will make sure you keep a good reputation, a strong reputation, Especially if you want to get into ministry one day, full-time ministry. You know, pastors are called to be blameless, okay? Pastors are, are, are called to a high standard, you know, to have a good report with them that are without, you know, those that are outside of the church environment, to have that good, clean, pure report, a good reputation. It's important you maintain that life, especially, I mean, for all of us, we should do that, but especially if you want to get into the ministry. Now, I got you guys to turn to, um, where did I get to turn to, Sorry. Hebrews 13. Let's go to Hebrews 13, verse 18. Hebrews 13, verse 18. The second benefit of being pure. And we'll ha let's read it first. The Bible says, pray for us. So this is, I believe, Paul okay, and Timothy. He says, pray for us, so as the leaders of the church, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things willing to live honestly. The Bible speaks highly about a good conscience, a pure conscience, a clear con conscience before the Lord. One of the, other, the second benefit of being pure is that you're going to be able to keep a clean or a clear conscience, okay? And I say, why is that? Look, honestly, to me, a clean conscience is priceless. Priceless. I mean, would I take all the wealth of the world or would I take a clean conscience? I take a clean conscience every day, every day of the week, you know? <laughs> Anytime I can make that decision, I will take the clean, the clean conscience. Now, I'm thankful that you know, I'm, I mean, obviously I'm a sinner. Obviously, uh, you know, that's, that, that goes without saying. But I, I'm thankful that, you know, most of my life I have been able to keep largely a clear conscience before the Lord, a clean conscience, okay? And when I do something that's wrong or sinful and I know I shouldn't have done that, boy, that's a burden on my heart. You know, that's a burden on my soul. And of course, we should commit those things and confess those sins to the Lord. But it's always hard when you've done those things. It's always hard to forgive yourself after the fact, you know, and, uh, you know, sometimes when you make the wrong decisions, it can have real lasting impacts, especially on other people, and that's why, you know, having a clear conscience, having a clean conscience before the Lord is so valuable to me, because it actually gives you great joy, it gives you great peace, it takes away the burden, because, you know, you're just walking in accordance to the ways of the Lord, you know, you're loving your brethren as you would love yourself to be loved, you know, you're trying to seek the ways of the Lord, even though you're not perfect, and let me tell you, boy, I mean, just having that clear conscience, knowing that, you know, you're not out there, you know, you're not creating unnecessary enemies, you're not creating unnecessary conflict, you know, it gives you this great joy uh, to be able to walk, you know, in, in purity. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying that to lift myself up or anything like that. It's just, you know, I had good parents, you know, they had a strict upbringing with me, so I didn't really mess up my life, you know, in any major way. And, I, and I, I'm thankful that I can have that clear conscience because I see how, Believers that don't have that clear conscience really struggle in life. You know, they're really downcast, really depressed because it's hard for them to forgive themselves even though they are called to forgive themselves and, and move on, okay? But it just makes life a lot easier, okay? So that, that is a benefit of purity. And, and lastly, um, it will make you wiser. It'll make you wiser if you keep yourself pure. Because we already saw if, you, if you're pure, then you will, you will see God. Okay? You will know God in, in a richer sense. You will know Him uh, more so, you know, in a more fuller sense than other people that are not pure. And I'll just I'll read to you if, you. if you guys can go to 2 Peter, please. You guys go to 2 Peter chapter 1. And I'm going to read to you from James chapter 3, verse 17. James chapter 3, verse 17. The Bible says this. Just pay attention to these first words. But the wisdom that is from above, the wisdom of God, the wisdom of heaven, okay, 
The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. You see, being pure will allow you to receive the wisdom in a greater sense uh, from that which is above. Because the wisdom is pure. The, the, the wisdom that God wants to give you will bring you peace and bring gentleness, all these kinds of things. You know, it'll make you wiser because you have the wisdom of God when you keep yourself pure. Okay, you'll have a greater knowledge of God. You'll have a greater understanding of the Word of God when you open up and search the Scriptures. All right? So the benefits of purity, just a reminder, you're going to be more trustworthy, valuable in the eyes of others. You're going to have a good reputation, a good, clean conscience, which is amazing. Let me tell you, man, if you can work toward having a clean conscience, you're going to love life a lot more, and it will give you the ability to become wiser, to understand the wisdom that comes from God, which is pure. All right? Now, just in conclusion, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. The conc- now, here's the thing, guys. It's really, it's really up to you, okay, if you want to live in purity or not. It's, it, it comes down to your decision. You know what the Lord expects from you. You know what the Lord wants from you. But again, we have the liberty. We have the liberty. Do we walk in purity or do we not? Okay? 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. See, God doesn't leave you alone to work this out. Okay? He wants to partner up with you and help you live a clean, pure life. It says here, according as his divine power have given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him and have called us to glory and virtue. See, the Lord has called you to glory and virtue. God has called you to a life of godliness. Okay? Okay? And of course, that would be purity, all right? And how has he done that? He's given you, at the beginning there, he says he's given you his divine power. God's, not only are you saved from your sins, but God's given you the power through him to, to live a godly, pure life, okay? He doesn't leave, make you, oh, now it's sorted out yourself. No, he gives you the power to do it. And if you're not living a life of purity, if you're not having victory over sins, you know, if, you, if you're still in the same place, you're not tapping into the power of God, okay? Verse number four. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, okay? Now, of course, positionally, we have escaped the corruptness of this world, okay? But we're not there yet. We're still living this life. We're still here with this sinful nature. We still have this flesh that lusts after sin, that lusts after all those things, okay? I don't, if you say to me, you know what, I don't, uh, you know, I don't lust over things. I don't, I, don't, I don't, you know, I have no desire to be sinful. You're a liar, okay? Because you've got the flesh. The flesh lusts after these things. But God has given us the power to overcome those lusts, okay? And it's by, by walking with Him. It's by holding on to those precious promises that God has given us. Partakers of the divine nature. Hey, what's the divine? Godly. You know, He's given us a nature that's like His. That's that new man. We talk about it, right? Being born again of the Spirit. We have that nature of God in us. We just need to make sure we tap into that. We walk in His paths. You know, we try to fix our lives up. We, we fight those sins. We fight the temptations. We ask the Lord God to help us, to empower us to do these things. Brethren, let me just finish by saying, you know, we need to seek a life of purity. Please don't get comfortable where you are. Don't be like, you know, well, you know, I, I was more wicked. I'm better now. This is the best I can do. No, that's not good enough. Yeah. Keep working toward that divine nature. Okay, keep walking in the spirit of God. Keep seeking purity. Keep overcoming the sins in your life and make sure you ask the Lord to empower you, give you the ability to do it. You're not going to be able to do it alone. You're not going to be able to do it in your flesh. Okay, it has to come from the power of God of that divine nature. All right, let's pray.